Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, I'm making this video with um, my two-year-old's uh, pet bunny, right? Don't get distracted. I would move the pet, the stuffed animal, but uh, that would cause problems in my family. So, okay, fine. You know, if they're going to have the stuffed animal here, I'm not touching her. All right. Well, let's talk about Golovkin's challenge of Canelo. Golovkin, according to reports, recently asked that Canelo take a lie detector test. A lie detector test. Over the issue of whether he's using PEDs. Now, let me just say, this reminds me of a great movie, one of the best I've seen, Goodfellas, where the mob boss, played by Paul Servino, right, only talks to two or three people directly, right? He never really opens up and talks to more than that for business reasons. Let me just point out that it's in that spirit that a lie detector test wouldn't work in this context, right? In my opinion, PEDs are a huge problem for boxing, bigger than even reported. This reminds me of baseball in the 1990s, where you saw guys, you suspected guys, then when they came out with the Mitchell Report, dozens and dozens of baseball players were implicated. Right? Some records you thought might be legit were proven to be not legitimate. We learned words like the cream and the clear. You had athletes testifying in front of Congress flatly saying, I don't want to talk about the past. I want to talk about the future. Now, my guess, looking at tapes of guys with a lot of belly fat, a certain muscle mass, and then seeing tapes of the guy just a year later, and he has no body fat on him. He has a lot of muscles, right? More muscles than probably any heavyweight had in the 1960s or the 1970s, before, in my opinion, the advent of PEDs became widespread in boxing right when you when you look at tapes and you see a guy with a certain level of hand speed and then suddenly as the guy gets older in his career his hand speed increases right there's certain things i believe experience can help you with technique for example maybe a guy has hand speed and foot speed but doesn't know how to put it together with the right trainer Maybe the guy will be more focused, more effective. But some of the stuff I'm seeing on tape defies gravity, figuratively speaking. Right? So, let's talk about why a lie detector test won't work in the context of a championship level. In other words, well-financed boxer and the testing of PEDs. You know, lie detectors won't work by design because of a concept developed by the Kennedy administration called plausible deniability. Put simply in a sentence, a nod and a wink beats a lie detector test. Understand, if a camp or a competitive fighter wants to use performance enhancing drugs, then they'll go out and they'll hire a nutritional expert who's known for cutting corners, right? Just like you have two eyes and I have two eyes, the people in these fighters' camps have two eyes, and they can see when a fighter suddenly has increased muscle mass, right? Suddenly has picked up hand speed somewhere. Right? The fighter might not be a gym rat, but yet the guy looks like he's working out all the time. 
right? They go back and look at films and they see a guy who, you know, has thin legs and a thin upper torso. Then suddenly they're looking at the guy and he has bodybuilding legs all of a sudden, right? And he hasn't gained that much weight because he's melted fat. So, Look at the nutritional experts in boxing. You're going to find out that some of these guys actually got busted in other sports for giving athletes performance-enhancing drugs. At least one very well-known trainer in boxing, very well-known, cooperated with law enforcement authorities and talked about how he gave athletes in another sport performance enhancing drugs. Well understand, the nutritional experts with, we'll call it a pharmaceutical bent, know the drugs and they know the excuses. They'll sit down not with the fighter, right? The fighter is not involved, just like President Kennedy wouldn't be in direct communication with someone talking about possibilities, just like the mob boss in Goodfellas, which is supposed to be based on a true story, wasn't going to sit down and directly communicate with people planning crimes, right? Just to understand when there's a discussion about the pros and cons of using certain substances, it wouldn't involve the fighter directly, right? Also, the conversation would be a hypothetical one. So you can imagine, you approach a nutritional expert because taking performance-enhancing drugs requires knowledge of dosage, etc., especially when you're getting tested by VADA. So you sit down with a nutritional expert, and the you being not the fighter, but a member of his camp, or a friend, right, or someone on the phone, and you talk hypothetically about what could possibly trigger a, a positive PED test, right, tainted meat, dietary supplements, how about some alleged medical condition, asthma, etc., low testosterone, that requires treatment with steroids, right? You had a fighter who held a belt. It's up to you to do the research on Google. You had a fighter who held a belt, who was found taking testosterone supplements. And then, of course, the kicker was that it was under his doctor's supervision. Right? Because he had low testosterone, we were told. Right? Of course, they're going to have medical records to support this. And, of course, nobody understood that this might violate boxing's drug testing protocol. That fighter continues to be an active part of the sport. So, understand, no one has to directly tell the nutritional consultant... to provide the fighter with steroids. No one has to. Rather, what they do is construct a narrative, right? These are the things that could cause a positive test for clenbuterol, tainted meat, right? All you have to do is construct the narrative and then say to the nutritional expert, you know, we understand there are risks in everything. Just understand that our fighter wants to do whatever it takes to win, right? Whatever it takes. That's the language people use, right? You have a football team, dominant football team in the 1970s, where, of course, the team slogan was whatever it takes. We now know several guys on that team may have been taking illegal substances, right? One of the athletes actually 
openly spoke about it, right? So let me just say this. The athlete could approve of taking PEDs to a close confidant, right? Or could hint that he's open to taking PEDs to a close confidant, but never expressly authorize or be completely aware of the fact that he's taking PEDs, right? So the athlete could sign off on, you know, some new nutritional program. The athlete could take injections even in furtherance of the program. But of course, there's a cover story, right? The athlete can claim as a Hall of Fame caliber baseball player claimed that the shots he was taking were B12 shots that he never had a specific intent, even when he was being injected, of taking PEDs. Rather, he was led to believe that it was B12 shots. Lord knows if the athlete is a superstar, if he's the one paying everyone else, right? His trainer, the nutritional consultant, you're going to have a lot of guys who would fall on a grenade for the athlete, right? Who would say, look, you know, uh, we did discuss B12 shots with the athlete. It's going to be very hard proving chain of custody or anything else, right? So I just want people to understand that the PED situation isn't as simple as forcing guys to take lie detector tests because savvy athletes will surround themselves with a team that understands that the athlete cannot right, sign off or be present at a meeting where PEDs are discussed. Right? And the team will understand that their mortgage, the payment of their children's private school education, their lifestyles are financed by the athlete. So it's a nod and a wink type deal where people really don't have the full information. Right? Often the trainers don't know. The trainers don't know that an athlete that they're training is using performance enhancing drugs. Let me give a specific example. One of the guys in boxing, he's old school, who's been trying to fight for fairness for years is Freddie Roach, right? Freddie is a guy who, you know, um, openly talks about how before a big fight, he was in the opponent's locker room looking at the hand wrap and they tried to get it past him. He shows up, the fighter's hands are wrapped. So then Freddie says, no, 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 no. I'm entitled to see the guy's hands getting wrapped. So when they cut off the gloves, Freddie, and this is a world-class fighter who was not disciplined, right? Freddie notices that the hand wraps are improperly done. To the boxing press with access to Freddie Roach, ask him about it. He notices that the hand wraps are not only improperly done, but there are substances on the hand wraps that would harden them. Now I'm not talking about Antonio Margarito, I'm talking about a different fighter, world-class fighter, right? World-class fighter. So of course, Freddie forces the opponent to get the hand wraps taken off and to get his hands rewrapped. And then of course the fight went forward. I don't believe this fighter has been disciplined to this day, right? So of course, Freddie, who, you know, talks about fighters trying to cut corners 
had a fighter, James Tony, who was busted for using banned substances. Right? My point, too, in talking about James Tony is the fact that when you look at a guy, you can't readily tell whether or not he's using banned substances. Let's just say James Tony didn't have the most chiseled physique. But yet, James Tony was using banned substances. At least he got busted for using banned substances. Freddie Roach had another fighter. He'll go nameless here in this video. Right? I'm protecting guys who haven't tested positive. But understand this fighter didn't want to be tested for drugs, even came up with the excuse that's crazy in this Olympic testing era, that the taking of blood from the fighter would make him weak. So you had a Hall of Famer, Marvin Hagler, come to the fighter's defense and say all this drug testing stuff is much ado about nothing. Right? Because there's that school of thought in the sport that fighters should fight and shouldn't worry what the other guy's taking. I'm just telling you the guys with regimented programs, programs where they're on cycles, where they're using, before fights are announced, before they enroll in drug testing protocols, Right? The fighters who understand what substances are oil-based, the fighters who know about new drugs, meldonium, right? that aren't yet on the banned list, and who use that in the lead-up to, to the championship part of their career, and then when meldonium is placed on the banned list, end up getting busted for it, right? If you don't believe that this is part of boxing, just Google it. Understand Freddie Roach ultimately had to fire a nutritional consultant from a fighter's camp. And there was an open question over whether or not the guy ever worked for Freddie Roach. Trainers only have so much power. Right? Who exactly employed the guy? Was it the fighter or the trainer? Let's talk about trainers too. Right? Many of these trainers have mortgages. Many of these trainers have kids who they want to send to college or private school or whatever. Put simply, many of these trainers have bills. Now who's going to stand up to the superstar fighter? The trainer who has very few star pupils who understands that this superstar fighter is his cash cow. This superstar fighter is the one paying most of his bills. Right? People need to understand the sway that these fighters have. Right? So the way the whole thing goes down is who are you going to give the lie detector test to? Right? Understand, too, you have fall guys. Right? So if you give the lie detector test to the nutritional consultant, he's going to say things like, look, you know, I gave the fighter this dietary supplement and the supplement was tainted and I was unaware of it. Right? That was the story for a fighter who got busted in Canada. Right? The argument was, hey, this supplement was tainted. Right? That was the story used by Dylan White in the UK. Understand, these stories are international. They cross borders. Right? Let me also say, too, that if they interview the fighter, the fighter might be able to say, look, I never authorized anyone 
to give me performance enhancing drugs. Right? The fighter never said, hey, nutritional consultant, give me clenbuterol. The fighter might not even know what clenbuterol is. Right? The conversation might have been one between the fighter and his representative, where the fighter simply said, hey, man, you know, I see uh, Dylan White is fighting a former heavyweight champion. Man, I, you know, I'd like to have whatever edge Dylan White had earlier in his career. Right? So then they might have had a hypothetical conversation about the hazards of dietary supplements and stuff like that. Right, folks? When you're operating in this world, you don't want black and white. You want gray. If it's gray enough, the fighter can say in a lie detector test, I never authorized anyone to give me PEDs and can pass. Right? Nobody has to take the fall, in fact. If the alibi is big enough, right? Because the setup will be structured in a way to support the alibi. So you have your camp in an area where there's tainted meat. You're busted for use of, and I'm speaking hypothetically here, right? I'm aware of defamation laws and stuff like that. We're just speaking hypothetically. I'm not targeting any individual. Right? But you have your camp in an area where there's tainted meat. And even if you're getting injected with substances, you know that if you fail, you always have the tainted meat alibi. You can have the B12 vitamin alibi. If your camp knows what they're doing, maybe they even give you B12 shots some of the time, right? So if you have a tox screen, at least your tox screen will show the presence of one of your alibis. For gamblers, let me say this. Oh, let me also say too, for the people who say, gee, if someone's juicing, why haven't they ever failed a drug test? To that, let me just say two words. Lance Armstrong. Okay, if you know what you're doing, if you know what you're doing, then you might not fail a drug test. Let me say too, you had a whole group of world-class sprinters in the 1980s who started failing drug tests. Their excuse, cough syrup, right? I'm, I'm not kidding, right? The, the people in this culture understand the plausible alibis, right? It's all a plausible deniability setup. So for gamblers, you're looking at guys, they're flying under the radar. You suspect that there might be PED use going on for whatever reason. The guy's physique is too chiseled. Right? The guy had no power. Now suddenly he has prodigious power. Right? The guy's hand speed somehow is in increasing. The baby fat seems to not be on the guy. Right? The guy doesn't have a reputation for being a gym rat, but yet... He seems to be adding muscles, right? Now, let me say this. There are substances, as people involved in the Tour de France know, that can increase your stamina. But what I believe to be true, and you should just have a secret list of guys who you think might be juicing. What I believe to be true is that the body is complicated and it's not ready for the stress of uncertainty coupled with unnatural muscles. So, in a rough and tumble fight, 
I found juicers have the advantage early on, right? Because they have unnatural muscle mass. They have more muscles than the other guy. But what I found is that if the other guy can survive the early rounds, when you get to the middle of the fight, the part where a fighter might need a second wind, right? If you push the roided up fighter, if you put him under stress, right? I believe boxing's different than riding a bike. Riding a bike, I'm on the countryside, I know the course, I see the hill, I can prepare myself for the hill. I believe in boxing, it's a little bit different. I might be fighting a guy with a hair trigger left hook. I might not see it coming. Or I see it coming just a split second before it comes. If the guy not juicing is able to push the guy who's juicing, I have literally seen guys who I thought were juicing, unnatural body mass, go from 100 to zero in one round. Right? It's as if the body says, hey, we got to send whatever, lactic acid or whatever, to the muscles and stuff like that. Then it's body overload. It's like an overheated computer. Right? A guy who's juicing will suddenly hit the valley. I've, I've literally seen a fight where a juicer was not a juicer, let me choose my words carefully, a guy I thought might be juicing, right? Whether he knew it or not, right? Because that's the not in a wink type relationship guys have with their camps. Whether he knew it or not, a guy who I thought might be juicing was winning a fight but was being pushed by his opponent. And literally the juicer falls face first on the canvas. Right? It was like his body just overloaded. Right? Fell face first on the canvas. So, I believe in situations like that, if you're watching a fight and you're seeing a juicer pushed, right, under heavy fire early, if you're on a live betting website, if the juicer is pushed enough, right, you might want to start looking at the knockout props because there is the possibility that a juicer will just break down. Let me also say too, that no one gets odder injuries than these juicers. Right? I'm a baseball fan. I can tell you some of the injuries you started hearing of in the 1990s were close to unprecedented. Right? Guys will pull tendons that you never knew the guy had. Right? The body, the tendons, the ligaments in your body are really for natural bodies. That's how they've evolved. Right? When juicers come in with twice the muscle mask, when juicers have little to any body fat, understand your body fat serves a purpose. Right? I'm just telling you that they're like a car that can overheat. If you've ever had a car that Overheated. You know what I'm talking about. You're on the road. It feels great and stuff like that. You glance down. Suddenly the engine's running hot. Suddenly you're seeing fumes come from the hood. And you know it's over. Let me also say this too, and I don't say it lightly. Guys who are on PEDs really have two big problems. I've mentioned this in another video, right? I believe 
One is what I've just discussed, the unnatural state of their body. Too many muscles, right? At some point, your body is going to make you pay, right? But they also have a mental problem. Understand, a lot of times it's not the physical, it's the mental. If a guy has been using PEDs to get by, right, and he knows it, it's very hard for that guy to be effective off of PEDs. Right? Also, the guy is going to not have the confidence, and I'm serious about this, he's going to lose the confidence that comes with winning an event cleanly. Right? If you beat some guy cleanly, whatever happens the rest of your life, you know on that night you won that fight. If you beat the guy when you're juiced up, you have no idea whether you could beat the guy cleanly. Right? That's speculation. The other problem, too, is just the paranoia that comes from others knowing your secret. Right? If you're clean, you know, your camp, whatever, you're not worried about guys spilling training secrets, right? Because what are the training secrets? Waking up at four in the morning, <laughs> you know, getting eight to ten hours of sleep a night, you know, sparring X number of rounds a day, you know, whatever. Those are normal trade secrets. But you can imagine if you're a juicer, and you're getting admired by the public and they're guys in your camp who know the secret to your success right you might end up like Lance Armstrong did a little bit paranoid suing people you thought might go public with your secret trying to discredit people who even suggested that you were a juicer all the while knowing that you were, right? So keep all of this in mind. Let me just say, it makes for good theater. It certainly sells tickets when Golovkin says, hey, I want Canelo to take a lie detector test. I'm just saying at this level, if Canelo were part of some, and I don't know, but if he were part of some orchestrated effort to use clenbuterol surreptitiously. Just understand it might be set up in such a way where he could pass a lie detector test. Right? Where he got shot with things, but he thought they were B12 shots. No one expressly told him he was using clenbuterol. Right? You could even have the guy. You know, the layers of protection are such that you can have the guy eating steak every night. Right? So, if you need the tainted meat alibi, the athlete can legitimately say, look, you know, I have been eating steak. Right? The steak might not even be tainted. But you have him eating steak as part of his training regimen. Because you understand you need plausible deniability. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Let me just say, too, to the gamblers, I'm shocked the betting line hasn't moved more here. Right? Whatever the truth is, whatever the truth is, if there's a possibility, if there's a possibility that Canelo has been on clenbuterol, Right? Whether he knew it or not, if there's a possibility that Canelo has been on clenbuterol in the past and now, and he's gotten the benefits of clenbuterol, right, which is supposed to help you cut weight, which is supposed to help you build muscle, right, then the fact that he's not on clenbuterol anymore. You know, the fact that he's been busted and he can no longer use clenbuterol should have you thinking, gee, how do I know 
that Canelo is going to be able to cut weight like he has in the past? How do I know that his muscle mass is going to be the same? Right? You don't. Let me say this too. Let's say, again, hypothetically, right? I don't know. I'm not making allegations here. But let's say Canelo is part of, let's say, an effort to juice. Let's say he feels that he wants to be the best he can be and that that includes juicing. Well, now that he's failed the clambuterol test, right, both the test and the retest, he knows he no longer has that crutch to lean on. He knows he's going into this bout naked. Let's say Golovkin's right. Let's say Canelo used something in the first fight. Well, Canelo would know that the first fight was a battle. Look at Canelo's KO ratio. It's huge, right? At a minimum, he would know Golovkin survived 12 rounds with him, right? Golovkin didn't fall down, didn't get stopped like countless Canelo opponents. So now Canelo would know that, hey, I'm going into this fight without all the bullets in my gun. Right? The edge I got, whatever caused me to use clenbuterol, this is if he's complicit in everything. I no longer have that. Right? Think it through. Both from a physical standpoint, where it doesn't matter what Canelo's intent was. If people around him have been giving him clambuterol, right, and I'm not saying I know that to be true, but if people around him have been giving him clambuterol, and if his performances have been clambuterol enhanced in the past, as a gambler, you've got to say to yourself, gee, without the enhancement against a fighter who got a draw against him, a draw that I thought was questionable, I thought, I thought Golovkin clearly won the first fight, right? then isn't that going to place Canelo at a disadvantage, not having the clenbuterol for the rematch? Right? So that's whether or not Canelo knew he was using clenbuterol. Right? If he used it. There are many questions here. So all I'm saying is, if you're on the Canelo side of the play for the fight, aren't you thinking that the risk has increased with this clambuterol news so much that the casino should be giving you better odds than the less than minus 200 odds that I'm seeing, right? Well less than minus, excuse me, well less than the two to one odds. Right? You're, you're not even getting two to one odds. Taking Canelo here. Think about it in reverse. Let's say Golovkin suddenly was busted with clenbuterol in his system. Let's say his alibi was so weak that it involved tainted meat, right? Which I consider to be a very weak alibi, just, just food for thought. Right? Um, you know, wouldn't you then start saying to yourself, gee, how do I know? Clembuterol wasn't in Golovkin's system before. Right? Folks, you don't know. All you have is information on which to do a risk assessment. This news is big news. The Clembuterol failed test by Canelo is big news, both from a physical standpoint and a mental standpoint. Let's say Canelo's an innocent. I'll close with this. Let's say Canelo is a complete innocent. And let's say he starts to suspect that his corner or people around him may have been giving him clenbuterol. Right? If he has that suspicion, is that healthy going into a fight? Is that a confidence builder? Right? Your secretariat and then suddenly you start to suspect that you might have been given deliberately by your camp substances that increased your speed. So then you start asking yourself, well, how fast am I without these substances? 
right? Think it through. These tests, to me, should have materially changed the betting line in Canelo against Golovkin. They haven't. I believe that increases the value you're getting on the Golovkin side of the play. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.